The next item of business is First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this morning, Scotland's Auditor General, Stephen Boyle, said this to the Parliament's Public Audit Committee about the £300 million estimate the SNP say it will cost to build two ferries. This is a direct quote from the Auditor General. It would be folly to suggest that is a reliable figure that will be spent to deliver the vessels at this stage. So will the First Minister continue to defend his government's estimate for these ferries, or does he agree with the Auditor General? That would be folly. First Minister. Well, what I would say, and of course I was listening uh, to uh, the evidence uh, this morning, and I'll uh, read uh, the rest of the evidence uh, later on uh, today, uh, Douglas Ross will be aware, of course, uh, the figure that was provided to the Public Audit Committee on the 22nd uh, of December last year from the CEO of Ferguson's Marine. Uh, that is made up uh, of a number of different factors. The Scottish Government is now reviewing these projections based on independent advice. That process of due diligence, which is of course uh, important in any, uh, in, in, in any uh, procurement, uh, of course, in any uh, programme of this size, of this scale, uh, but particularly given the cost overruns, even more important in the case of Ferguson's uh, Marine. That process of due diligence is to conclude uh, within uh, the next uh, few weeks. Regardless of that, of course, I repeat what has been said before when this question uh, rightly has been raised by members of the opposition. Uh, it is uh, unacceptable that we've had these cost uh, uh, overruns, the fact that we have had the delays to both uh, 801 uh, and uh, 802. And again, once again, as First Minister, two island communities uh, for those cost overruns and for those delays. But we are focused on getting these vessels complete uh, so that island communities uh, will see the benefit uh, of these vessels. Douglas Ross. I think even the mic operator had given up on that answer and switched it off because there is absolutely uh, nothing there. Only a party that bought a camper van for 100 grand could think that paying hundreds of millions of pounds for two massively delayed ferries is a good deal. And we all know from the scandal engulfing the SNP that they really struggle with finances. But this is getting ridiculous. So will the First Minister stop the secrecy and be honest for a change. How much higher is the real cost to taxpayers going to be to deliver these two ferries? First Minister. I'm not sure I'll take too many lessons on financial literacy from the party of Kwasi Karteng and Liz Trust. Uh, uh, officer. But on the, on the important issue that Douglas Ross is absolutely right to raise uh, in this chamber. Uh, what I have said is that there is rightly a process of due diligence underway. That process will conclude in the next few weeks, and of course we will make it uh, known what the, result was, what the result was of that due diligence. Uh, what I will uh, never shy away from saying, uh, rightly, that of course the cost overruns and the delays uh, in relation to these two vessels is unacceptable. The island communities uh, that are frankly frustrated and angry at those uh, cost delays, uh, those cost overruns and the delays, uh, I completely accept uh, their frustration uh, and their anger. And therefore, uh, we will continue to invest in Ferguson's uh, Marine. We will continue to do what we can to get these vessels uh, ready in relation to the updated timescales. But that due diligence is important, and of course, that, will due, uh, that is due to be complete in the next few weeks. Douglas Ross. I mean, the Auditor General knows the 300 million figure is folly, but it seems that the First Minister doesn't. He doesn't have a clue about the actual cost it's going to be uh, for taxpayers here in Scotland. The bill for these vessels so far is already three times more than the original contract. But it gets worse, what we heard this morning, and the First Minister said he was listening to the evidence. So he will have heard the Auditor General reveal this morning that the bonus system for highly paid executives at Ferguson Marine is still in place. The two ferries are not fit to sail, the costs keep spiralling out of control and islanders continue to be left without vital lifeline services. So First Minister, what on earth could these bonuses possibly be for? First Minister. Well, again, again I, I, I won't disagree uh, with Douglas Ross or neither uh, with the Auditor General, who of course the Section 22 report uh, earlier uh, this year made it clear that these bonuses should not uh, have happened. They should not have been paid. I, I agree. 
if Douglas Ross uh, will listen to the answer, I will give him genuinely an answer uh, members, to the question that he members, is absolutely right to raise. We will hear the First Minister. Now, the Thank former you. Deputy First uh, Minister made it clear uh, his anger, we share that anger, I share that anger at the fact the bonuses have been paid. Uh, the bonuses that are being paid, of course, relate to a decision made by the Remuneration uh, Committee of Ferguson's Marines without consultation with the government in November 2022. And those bonuses, uh, I have asked if they can not be paid. Of course, the advice coming back is that they are a contractual obligation. Now, for future bonuses, for any future discussion uh, or consideration of bonuses, I have made it clear there should not be bonuses paid in relation to vessels 801 and 802. So that has been made clear. The chair will take forward, uh, all Ferguson's Marines will take forward uh, that work. It is my expectation, the government's expectation, and the chair of Ferguson's Marine uh, knows this absolutely well, that there should not be bonuses in 23-24, the current financial year that we're in, in relation to this year, in relation to vessels 801-802. Douglas Ross. On every front, the SNP is engulfed in scandal, secrecy and a shameful waste of money. They are groaning about a waste of money when the First Minister has just accepted how much this is going to cost taxpayers. This week, the SNP's ex-treasurer, Colin Beattie, said it wasn't me, Gov, when he was asked about the notorious camper van before abruptly changing his mind. And Hamza Youssef has said he isn't sure if Scottish Government ministers are using burner phones. That's what the First Minister said. This is all starting to look like uh, an episode of Line of Duty. But it's also a massive distraction preventing the SNP from getting on and delivering these vital services to island communities. And the problem for the First Minister is he has been personally involved in this ferry scandal from the very beginning. He was there at the SNP conference in 2015, beaming beside the disgraced Derek Mackay when the contract was announced. In 2016, he was behind Nicola Sturgeon, hoping one day he would be the first minister to launch a ship with painted on windows. And he was the transport minister inspecting the yards for years. Presiding officer, we found a picture uh, of the first minister when he was transport minister visiting one of the yards. He was there that day to mark the halfway point in the build of these ferries. The only problem for Hamza Youssef is that picture was taken at the halfway point, according to him, in December 2016, <laughs> more than six years ago. First Minister, that wasn't the halfway point. It wasn't even the start of this sorry saga. So how is the First Minister, who got us into this mess, going to fix it? Before the First Minister responds, I will just remind all members that we do not use props in the Chamber. First Minister. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it just a, a sign of Douglas Ross's uh, real desperation, pathetic schoolboy tactics, inability to raise. Thank you, uh, the game. members. An inability actually to address what is a really serious issue because I agree with the opposition when they uh, rightly state the anger of island communities that these ferries uh, are, have not been completed. So I give an absolute commitment, an absolute guarantee to those island communities that we are focused, and of course Ferguson's Marines will receive the resources uh, that are required on the back of that due diligence that is being done in relation to the cost. So there are things that we should apologise for and we will apologise for as the government. What we won't apologise for is, of course, saving hundreds of jobs in Port Glasgow at Ferguson's Marine. And Douglas Ross is, is shaking his head. I'm not surprised. He, of course, belongs First Minister, to a party First Minister, that has put... First Minister, if you will just give me a moment. People are gathered here to hear questions. Put to the First Minister to hear the First Minister respond. Can we please ensure that that is possible? First Minister. And the reason, of course, why Douglas Ross was shaking his head when I was mentioning the fact that we have saved hundreds of jobs at Port Glasgow at Ferguson's Marine is because he belongs to a party, of course, that decimated communities yeah, yeah, up and down Scotland and left workers on the scrap heap, presiding officer. And... He, of course, decided in his question to take a swipe uh, at the SNP. Can I remind him, of course, that this week the SNP did release 
its membership numbers. I'm pleased that we've seen an increase in our membership numbers over the last few weeks. And the Tories, of course, demanded that we release our membership figures. We've done that. Uh, of course, Douglas Ross does not practice what he preaches. He hasn't released his membership figures. Uh, there is a word for people that don't practice what they preach. They're called hypocrites, presiding officer. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, I know the First Minister has spent the past few weeks thinking about financial mismanagement and the criminal justice system. Uh, so today I'd like to ask him about the overspend in the project to replace Berlini Prison. Because the issue of financial mismanagement is not just about how the SNP run their party, it's about how they govern our country. This government's failure in managing the public finances has cost the taxpayer more than £3.7 billion. That's the result of failed interventions, waste and incompetence. Earlier this week, it was reported that the cost of building a new prison to replace Berlini has spiralled from £100 million to £400 million. So can the First Minister confirm that this project is running over budget, what he expects the final cost to be, and whether the new prison will be operational as planned in September 2026? First Minister. We are, we are, and this is an important issue, of course, raised by Anna Sauer, we are looking at the cost uh, overruns. We're seeing what can be done to mitigate those cost uh, overruns. I think we all agree uh, in relation to uh, the fact that uh, Berlini is not in the condition that any of us uh, would like it uh, to be in. So we are exploring uh, what can be done. Can I just say to, to Anna Sauer, I think he does uh, the debate a disservice when he talks about uh, the figure that he used, over £3 billion uh, of wastage, as he describes it. In reference to that, I've seen the Labour press release. It talks about decisions that are for the Crown, for example, the Rangers prosecution. Uh, that, is not a, that is not a decision for the SNP government. That is an independent uh, decision, of course, uh, for uh, the Crown and Procurator uh, Fiscal uh, Service. So it does nobody, a, uh, it does in fact a disservice to the debate uh, to include uh, figures uh, like that. Uh, so we are interrogating uh, the figures in relation uh, to Berlini. Of course, construction costs have increased for a whole number of reasons, for, uh, of course, uh, partly to do with the UK government's uh, complete mismanagement of the economy, but also to do with some global factors uh, as well. We know the, the, the war uh, against Ukraine, the illegal uh, invasion by Russia, uh, of course, has uh, also affected uh, construction costs as well. But to give him uh, a direct answer to his question, those uh, cost overruns uh, are being interrogated and we'll do everything we can to bring them down. Anna Sarwar. It's interesting that the First Minister wants to dispute £60 million pounds out of £3.7 billion pounds of waste under this SNP government. And I'm sorry, blaming Ukraine or the wider economic crisis or inflation on this crisis is not going to work. It, the, this is a 3 this is a 300% increase in costs at a Members. time when inflation is running at 10%. Even an SNP treasurer can tell you those figures don't add up. Because Scotland's prison estate is in a dire condition. At Greenock Prison, the Chief Inspector of Prisons is threatening to bring in the Health and Safety Executive because of the state of the building. In Inverness, the Prisons Inspectorate has said the prison is not fit for purpose. That prison was due to be replaced at an original cost of £52 million. That cost has now risen to almost £140 million. In fact, in all five major capital programmes in the criminal justice system, all are running over budget. So if the First Minister truly believes in transparency, will he commit to opening up the books and would he welcome an Audit Scotland review into these projects so we can understand why costs are running out of control? First Minister. Again, I mean, any sensible suggestions around uh, the cost overruns uh, I'm happy to take away uh, and to explore. But it is uh, astonishing uh, that Anna Sauer seems to suggest that these global factors, as well as, of course, domestic factors uh, in relation to inflation, don't have any bearing on construction costs. I think that is uh, not uh, the reality. Of course, what has not helped uh, our economy, what hasn't helped the economy at all, uh, is, of course, a hard Brexit, which is now supported uh, by the Scottish Labour Party quite unbelievably too. So Anna Sauer is, of course, uh, right to stand up here uh, and to question the costs, uh, be it of uh, HMP, Barlini, and indeed uh, the other prisons uh, and indeed other infrastructure projects. Absolutely correct uh, to do so, and they will be interrogated. You can uh, bet uh, your bottom dollar that they will be uh, interrogated because, of course, we are, uh, we are absolutely uh, in uh, really challenging financial circumstances. Again, no thanks 
uh, to the UK government. But what I would say to Anna Sauer, when his party was in charge, of course, uh, their PFI projects, we are still having to pay. We are still having to pay a quarter of a billion in PFI payments because of the Scottish Labour Party. That certainly doesn't help our budget in any way, shape or form. Anna Sauer. The, uh, the First Minister talked about desperation earlier on. It is really, really desperate to say that a 300% increase in the cost of Berlini prison is due to somehow global factors around Ukraine and perhaps even Vladimir Putin. And it's also desperate, 16 years into an SNP government, to talk about decisions made by a government when the First Minister was 12 years old. Mr. Sarwar, Mr. Sarwar. And take responsibility for a change. I would be grateful when Mr Sarwar is putting his question if we could hear it and if members could resist the temptation to make comment at that point. Mr Sarwar. I, I can understand why they're frustrated, Prying Officer, so I'll maybe give them a bit of slack uh, this week and maybe in future weeks uh, as well. Because right across the public sector, project after project is running out of control. In health, the new Baird Family Hospital in Aberdeen, initial budget, 163 million, now 244 million. In education, a new college campus in Dunfermline. Initial budget, 86 million. New budget, 119 million. And of course, in transport, replacement ferries for lifeline routes. Initial budget, 97 million. Now running close to 300 million. While families across Scotland are working out how to make ends meet, this SNP government and this First Minister's incompetence is allowing millions of pounds to disappear. This is a government that has been in power for 16 years and has lost grip on taxpayers' money and weakened every institution in our country. Scotland can no longer afford this chaotic, dysfunctional SNP government. Arrogant, incompetent can we and have out a of question, touch. Mr. So Sarwar. is it any wonder that people are concluding that it's time for change? First Minister. When it comes to uh, the important issues of inequality and poverty, of course, that will be and continues to be a defining mission for this government. That's why, of course, we've invested in that game-changing Scottish child payment, which we know has lifted uh, many hundreds of thousands uh, out uh, of, of poverty. When it comes to the fuel and security fund, that was one of the first announcements, in fact, the first announcement uh, I made as First Minister, not just to double it, uh, but of course uh, to triple it. Our Social Security uh, Scotland, we have a number of benefits, uh, seven benefits that are available only uh, in Scotland. A social security system that is based on fairness, dignity uh, and compassion. So that is, of course, our focus when it comes to tackling uh, inequality. Anna Sawar says uh, we are desperate talking about decisions made uh, by the last Labour government. I agree with him. It was many, many, many uh, moons ago and for good uh, reason. And of course, Jackie Bailey uh, was in government very briefly uh, in government uh, at that point. But it is important to say the reason why we're still talking about it, the reason why we are still talking about it is because we are still paying for it and Labour mortgaged our future. The Labour Party, the Scottish Labour Party, didn't just mortgage our future, they are mortgaging our children's future uh, as well. So the fact that we are having to pay hundreds of millions in PFI payments uh, 16 years on uh, is, in fact, uh, is, is undoubtedly uh, the reason why Anna Sarwar doesn't want us talking about it. But, presiding officer, the important issues around construction of our prisons, of our infrastructure projects, I take seriously, this government takes it seriously, uh, and I can give them an absolute promise that we are doing everything we can to bring those costs down. Yeah. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Tuesday. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful for that reply. Uh, Presiding Officer, it's enough to fill 19,000 Olympic sized swimming pools. That's how much sewage we know was dumped into our rivers last year by Scotland's government-owned water company. I say no because only one in 20 discharge pipes are actually monitored. But in addition to this, new Liberal Democrat research that we are publishing today reveals over 400 sewage dumps in the vicinity of some of Scotland's best beaches last year. From Peterhead to St Andrews, these award-winning beaches should be protected and pristine. They draw tourists, families and wild swimmers. But like so many other things on the First Minister's desk right now, this absolutely stinks. 
So can I ask the First Minister, will he now instruct the monitoring of all sewage discharges in Scotland? And what will he do to help Scottish Water get a handle on this? Otherwise, how many swimming pools of poo is he content to see put on our best-loved beaches? First Minister. Well, this is a serious uh, issue, and Asko Hamilton, of course, is right to, 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 to raise it. Uh, what I would say, uh, of course, that our beaches, and he mentions a number of them uh, in his question uh, to me, uh, are uh, world-class tourist destinations. So I don't want to see uh, a single uh, sewage dump uh, where it is uh, absolutely uh, unnecessary. So I will take up the issue personally with Scottish Water. I know my Cabinet uh, uh, Secretary uh, is doing that uh, directly uh, with uh, Scottish uh, Water. So he is right to absolutely raise the issue. I will look at it uh, personally myself. I will raise it personally myself uh, with uh, Scottish Water and come back uh, to the member in due course. Question number four, Stephanie Callaghan. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to Alcohol Focus Scotland's emergency call to urgently take action to prevent further deaths and reduce harm from alcohol. First Minister. Well, first and foremost, my deepest sympathy, and I suspect uh, the deepest sympathy of all of the Chamber, goes to those that have been affected uh, by the loss of a loved one through alcohol. We remain absolutely determined to reduce alcohol-related harm. <coughs> uh, that's why we've introduced initi initiatives such as our world-leading minimum, minimum unit pricing. It, recent research, of course, estimates has saved hundreds of lives. As outlined last week, I'm absolutely committed to reviewing the current level of minimum unit pricing alongside other ongoing work, such as the upcoming UK alcohol treatment guidelines, uh, development of alcohol treatment targets for April 2024, and the expansion of our residential rehab capacity by 50% by the end of this Parliament. Uh, last year, £106.8 million was made available to alcohol and drugs partnerships to support local and national initiatives. We will carefully consider the points that have been raised by Alcohol Focus Scotland uh, and the Minister for Drugs and Alcohol is due to meet with them and other stakeholders in the coming weeks to discuss our approach to tackling alcohol harm. Stephanie Callaghan. I thank the First Minister for his answer, and I know he will agree that the ongoing alcohol emergency requires a public health-led policy response to save even more lives and reduce health inequalities. So, with this in mind, I really appreciate the update there on the developing the alcohol treatment targets. And are you able to say anything about the alcohol brief interventions? Thank you. First Minister. That's a really important point raised by Stephanie Callaghan in relation to alcohol uh, brief uh, interventions. We remain absolutely committed to uh, our ABI delivery uh, programme. It's been in place for 10 years. We've seen excellent progress uh, and sustained delivery of the national ABI programme across Scotland uh, today. And can I congratulate local partners uh, on the fantastic achievement of that. The alcohol framework uh, does make a commitment to reviewing the evidence on current delivery of ABIs to ensure they're being carried out in the most uh, effective uh, manner. So we're working with Public Health Scotland to review the evidence in the current delivery of alcohol brief interventions to determine how the system uh, could, be better, could better meet uh, the needs uh, of uh, individuals. And I will uh, update the <coughs> member in due course once that review uh, has been complete. Carol Mockin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We know from National Records of Scotland and Alcohol Focus Scotland that alcohol-specific death rates in Scotland's most deprived areas are over five times higher than in the least deprived areas. Similarly, with hospital stays linked to alcohol, we see rates six times as high in our most deprived, deprived communities compared to our most affluent. This is a, there is a clear need for improved access to alcohol-related support services in our most deprived areas who are being badly let down by this government. The alcohol-related and wider health inequalities that exist in our country are both deep and divisive. His predecessor did little to address them. How can the country have any confidence that he will do any better? First Minister. I don't agree with that final uh, point, of course. It was my predecessor when she was Health Secretary that introduced minimum unit pricing uh, for alcohol. And, of course, it was successive Health Secretaries at the time, of course, that made sure we pushed ahead in the face of considerable opposition, uh, our minimum unit pricing for alcohol. And my understanding, of course, there was considerable opposition from Scottish Labour uh, to minimum unit pricing uh, of alcohol. And when she talks about saving... Uh, like, sorry, when uh, Carol Mockin talks about saving lives, it's worth saying that research about minimum unit pricing alcohol has shown us that more than 150 lives a year uh, have been saved and have resulted, uh, yeah. the MUP has also resulted in 411 fewer 
hospital admissions. Uh, we're also encouraging to see that that research, and I'm happy to share uh, a copy with Carol Mockin because it's directly related to her question, that the policy is having an effect in Scotland's most deprived areas, which experience yeah. higher death rates and levels of, of, of harm uh, from problem alcohol usage. So I'm happy uh, to give uh, Carol Mockin further detail of what more can be done, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'm confident in saying uh, that this government is taking action on alcohol-related harm, particularly in areas of highest deprivation. Willie Rennie. A new study from the University of Glasgow found a correlation between the minimum unit pricing and the 13.4% reduction in deaths. But the 50 pence rate was set over a decade ago and inflation has been raging since. So we do need a change to catch up. So will the First Minister bring forward that review of minimum unit pricing, uprate it from 50 pence, and bring forward legislation to tie it to inflation to save lives in the future? First Minister. Can I, can I uh, pay credit to, to Willie Rennie? I know he has raised this issue many, many times. When I was Health Secretary, he raised the issue with me uh, a, a few times uh, as well, and he makes a really important point uh, about uh, the research. Uh, Willie Rennie will, of course, know, because uh, he was in Parliament uh, at the time, that there was robust legal challenge in relation to minimum unit uh, pricing. So we are uh, ensuring, of course, that when it comes to review of minimum unit pricing, that we have as robust evidence in place if there ever was to be another legal challenge to a potential increase uh, in the minimum unit uh, pricing. So, so important that uh, we do have that robust evidence base to, to, to determine and support any decision uh, on a change in the level of MUP. The conclusion of the review of the level of MUP uh, will be concluded in late 2023. Uh, really, Rennie has asked me to look to see if that can be brought forward. I, of course, will do that. I'll have that discussion. But I just go back to my first point, of course, it's so important that we have a robust evidence in place for any uh, decision that is made in relation to minimum unit pricing. Question number five, Jamie Green. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to new Police Scotland statistics uh, showing that the number of recorded rapes has increased to its highest level in six years. First Minister. Let me say, uh, first and foremost, that it is uh, abhorrent that women continue to face violence uh, and, and rape, and we will continue to take robust <coughs> action to tackle sexual offending through Scotland's equally safe strategy, focused on prevention, on improving support and modernising the law. It's vitally important that anyone who faces violence, uh, sexual violence, rape in particular, has the confidence and support uh, to report these crimes, and that the justice system does respond. Uh, Jamie Green will be uh, well aware, in fact, I think I heard him uh, on the radio uh, this morning speaking about the Victims, Witnesses uh, and Justice Reform Scotland Bill introduced uh, to Parliament this week. That will further strengthen uh, the response of the justice uh, system, putting victims and witnesses, crucially, at the very heart of the justice system. It also proposes to implement the significant reforms that were recommended by Lady Dorian in her report to improve the management of sexual offences, including a specialist court for sexual offending. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the First Minister and uh, echo many of the comments he's made. And we should also, as a Parliament, commend the bravery of those who do come forward to report this horrific crime. But I think it's a dangerous assumption to make that a rise in recorded cases is simply a byproduct of more people coming forward and not an underlying rise in the levels of crime of this nature itself. And that's the sort of qualitative work I would expect the government to already be doing in this regard. The real problem, presiding officer, is that the entire system from end to end is letting victims of crime down, from the initial reporting experience to the lengthy delays in getting trials to come to pass up to four years in some cases. It's horrendous. The court experience itself is re-traumatizing. And even if, and it is an if, a conviction is secured, and we all know that conversion rates are notoriously low, in Scotland. The victim of that crime faces the injustice of watching the perpetrator dished out a lenient sentence relative to the gravity of the crime that was committed against that victim. So what I would say to the First Minister, as a former Justice Secretary himself, is if he will make a personal commitment today to those victims of this horrific crime, that he will undertake a root and branch review of how this country handles and processes uh, cases of rape. Will he undertake a review into why these figures are at such high levels in Scotland? And we, will he commit to work, working with victims organisations and victims themselves to finally put them at the heart of this justice system? Far too many women have been let down by the system, and that's got to change, presiding officer. 
First Minister. Can I thank uh, Jamie Green for what was a really uh, important question? And some, uh, many of the points I, I agree with, some uh, perhaps uh, I, will, I, will, I will try to address and, and come back uh, to him uh, in writing in further detail. What I would say is he's right. We don't make an assumption uh, that uh, the, the rise in cases is simply down to uh, greater reporting and greater awareness. Though it's fair to say, uh, in terms of non recent cases, historical cases, we have seen a rise. Uh, in, in the reporting, and that's not just the case in Scotland. We know that's the case right across the UK, and I, I suspect in many jurisdictions uh, right uh, across the world. Um, there has been a focus on trying to raise awareness uh, of reporting cases of rape and sexual offences in particular. There's also been a greater consistency in approach in the use of specialist police officers uh, in this regard uh, as well. In terms of a few of the points that Jamie Green uh, raises, and I think he is absolutely right to raise them, um, that is the entire purpose, of course, of the Victims, Witnesses uh, and, and, and Justice Reform uh, Bill that has been introduced. It is putting victims and witnesses at the heart uh, of our justice system. I, uh, um, I, I have the great pleasure of meeting a number of families uh, and activists, campaigners, victims, witnesses, survivors yesterday at a meeting to discuss the bill. I say great pleasure because um, out of the most horrific circumstances, and enormous tragedy, uh, they have been at the heart of campaigning uh, through their bravery, through their courage for better reform to the justice system. And the bill that we have introduced, uh, I think it's fair to say, by any objective measure, is bold, it's ambitious, probably the biggest change uh, that we will see in our justice system if the bill is passed in decades, some might even say uh, longer uh, than that. Um, what I would say to, to, to Jamie Green is he's asked for a, a kind of root and branch review, I think, of uh, sexual offences and, and, and rape cases. Of course, that uh, review was done by Lady Dorian, and of course, many of the recommendations or many of the uh, clauses within the bill are a direct result uh, of that work done by Lady uh, Dorian. So we'll continue to invest uh, in the justice system to continue to <coughs> bring those court backlogs down, and they are, uh, of course, uh, falling. Uh, what I would say to Jamie Green is that uh, Angela Constance, Cabinet Secretary, uh, for Justice and Home Affairs, who is leading uh, this bill. Uh, she will be engaging with every single opposition member, as you would expect her to. Uh, and of course, we will take this bill forward in as open-minded and a constructive way so we can take, hopefully, all of this parliament uh, through these justice reforms together. Colleen McNeill. These alarming statistics on rape are a further indication of ingrained levels of violence against women and misogyny. Across our society, Scottish Labour has been running a consultation with the full involvement of government officials to tackle violence against women. But sadly, it has confirmed existing research that young girls have been subjected to a rape culture in schools and across university campuses. And many are receiving unwanted sexual images becoming too normalised behaviour. I hope the First Minister will agree with me that we need to tackle the root cause of the problem in our society by talking directly to boys and young men in all of our schools and our campuses to talk about their attitude to women and girls. First Minister. I, mean, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with Pauline uh, McNeill's uh, question and the statements uh, that uh, she makes when I was Justice Secretary. Uh, again, uh, I would say I had the pleasure of seeing a programme being delivered in a school uh, not too far away from this parliament, which was directly talking to young boys, particularly around the issue of consent. Uh, and it was a really engaging uh, session uh, that was had uh, there. And Paul McNeill was absolutely right. We have to tackle the root cause. And the root cause, of, unfortunately, is predatory men. And uh, we have to intervene as early as we possibly can. Uh, and I support uh, everything uh, that Pauline uh, McNeill uh, said in her question. Uh, we have, as a government, supported and will continue to support Emily's test. I know Paul McNeill is very aware of the fantastic work that is done by Fiona uh, Dre uh, and, of course, by Emily's family. Again, a terrible a horrific tragedy, uh, using that tragedy to make sure uh, that nobody else hopefully has to suffer uh, what uh, Emily uh, had to suffer. So we've supported Emily's test uh, to create its groundbreaking gender-based violence uh, charter. I think it's the only initiative of its kind uh, in the UK. Uh, what I'd finally say to Polly McNeill, uh, if I heard her correctly, uh, I believe she said that they were, uh, the Scottish Labour Party were undertaking uh, their own consultation uh, when that is ready uh, to be published, uh, if she wouldn't mind sharing that with me personally, but of course with the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Justice and Home Affairs, I'd be very, very interested uh, in the results of that consultation. Question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that published NHS waiting times for treatment are accurate. First Minister. Uh, published statistics are collated and quality assured by Public Health Scotland. They're published as part 
uh, of the full release of national statistics each quarter. Uh, national statistics status means that the official statistics meet the highest standards, the highest standards of uh, trustworthiness, of quality, of public value. Uh, the UK Statistics Authority has designated PHS stats as national statistics, therefore, therefore signifying uh, their compliance with the Code of Practice for Statistics. Jackie Bailey. There are, of course, one in seven Scots on waiting lists currently, and senior clinicians have warned that the waiting time statistics published on NHS Inform are both inaccurate and misleading. I wrote to the UK Statistics Authority in October last year. They agreed and asked the Scottish Government to make changes. Six months later, and very little has changed. Clinicians are still up in arms about the stats being skewed. The Scottish Government continues to use median waiting times and mixes emergency and elective care. So can I ask the First Minister, will he now stop pulling the wool over people's eyes, rectify this misleading data, and can he tell us, did he publish the stats whilst knowing about the criticism of their flaws? First Minister. Uh, no, uh, we did not. Uh, and of course, we uh, read uh, the letter, received the letter uh, from uh, the Stats Authority. Uh, and of course, I engaged with uh, Scotch, the Scottish uh, Society of Orthopaedic uh, uh, con uh, Consultants. And, I, I, and of course, I'm, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary for Health will continue uh, to meet uh, with the same uh, organisation. Uh, it is incorrect for Jackie Bailey to suggest that changes weren't made. So she's right, of course, we received that letter. Uh, in October uh, 2022. We then worked with Public Health Scotland and NHS 24 to review and address those key points that were made. Uh, following the recommendations from the Office of Statistic Regulations, uh, we made a number of changes. That included, for example, highlighting both the strengths and indeed the limitations that the data uh, showed, showed on the website. There is also now additional links for the full release of national statistics uh, on the PHS website. That provides further information uh, dist uh, further information in relation to the distribution uh, of waiting times uh, for patients who have completed their waits, but also those who ha are still uh, waiting. And in terms of um, the criticism from the Scottish Committee uh, for Orthopaedics uh, and Trauma, Scott, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care will, of course, uh, continue to meet with them. But can I commend them uh, and their members and all of those working in NHS Scotland for the fact that despite significant ongoing pressure, of course, we have seen that the number of outpatients waiting longer than two years for a new outpatient appointment has reduced by 50 per cent since September 2022 uh, and by over 60 per cent since June 2022. Thank you. We move to general and constituency supplementaries and I call Claire Hawhey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister may be aware that South Lanarkshire Council has recently increased the cost to local youth teams and clubs who hire football pitches, swimming pools and halls by up to 114 per cent. I have spoken with many from across Rutherglen constituency who fear they cannot afford this and are worried that the clubs may have to fold. Does the First Minister agree with me that the Labour administration at South Lanarkshire Council should be focusing on increasing uptake of sports and physical activity, that temporarily suspending the increase isn't good enough and that instead they should be scrapping these damaging price increases without further delay? Can I, um, be before the First Minister responds, can I just remind members of the requirement to that questions should relate to matters for which the Scottish Government has general responsibility. And if you can answer in that light, First Minister. Well, while it is uh, clearly for local administrations to determine their own priorities, uh, but like Claire Hawking, frankly, I'm appalled at the actions of Labour-led authority in South Lanarkshire. I saw a protest uh, taking place by young people uh, suggesting that it was time for Joe, uh, Joe Fagan, the leader of uh, South Lanarkshire Council, to go. I have to say I think those young people have frankly very good judgment indeed. So while families are facing ongoing eye-watering hikes in food and energy bills, having to cut back another expenditure, this is not the right time to ramp up these charges and potentially deny children and young people in constituencies like Rutherglen the chance to take part in sport. So I can only hope uh, that uh, the Council see sense and turn this temporary reprieve into a permanent one. Virgil Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. On Friday last week, Tayside Aviation, based in Dundee, went into administration with the immediate loss of 22 jobs. 
Tayside Aviation partnered with a number of universities, providing degree courses in pilot training. Students on these courses, some of them my constituents, now face an uncertain future, not able to complete their degrees and having lost thousands of pounds in fees paid up front to Tayside Aviation, which may not be recoverable. Some students have student loans now to repay, but nothing to show for the money. So how can the Scottish Government help my constituents caught in this desperate situation? First Minister. This is a very important issue, and Murdo Fraser, Murdo Fraser, of course, is right to, to raise it here. I'm very uh, saddened to hear uh, of the job losses at Tayside Aviation. My thoughts, of course, are with the wor workers that have been affected, uh, their families, and rightly so, with the students uh, as well. And I appreciate that this position uh, has, put, uh, has put students uh, in great difficulty. I understand their concerns about money that they've paid uh, for lessons, and anybody impacted uh, should, of course, uh, contact the joint administrators uh, for their information, including links to the Joint Administrator's Insolvency Portal are on the Tayside Aviation website. Uh, we're actively taking steps to understand how this will impact students funded by the Scottish Government. Uh, university students uh, should have been contacted directly by uh, their university, and we're also engaging with Middlesex University, who are delivery partners uh, for uh, that uh, course. Uh, I should have said, in terms of the workers uh, as well, uh, our PACE team uh, uh, stand ready uh, to be able to offer any assistance they can. Uh, we'll continue to uh, uh, examine and explore uh, this issue to see what we can do uh, to minimise the impact on the students in particular, and I'll report back uh, to Murdo Fraser in due course. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. So last week, Yes Recycling Fife entered administration as a result of cash flow difficulties stemming from its inability to operate at full capacity. Only opened in September last year, it is a state-of-the-art recycling centre and now 60 jobs are on the brink. It received £520,000 from the Circular Economy Investment Fund, administered by Zero Waste Scotland, with funding from the European Regional Development Fund and the Scottish, uh, Scottish Government. Can I ask what discussions the Scottish Government have had to determine why, after less than a year, this important facility has collapsed and has been unable to operate at full capacity? And what support the Scottish Government are offering to the employees? First Minister. I am concerned uh, about uh, the difficulty that ES Recycling uh, finds itself uh, in. And of course, my thoughts uh, with those uh, 60 uh, staff members that are working uh, at uh, the company and the facility uh, in Glen Glenrothes. This will be a very, very difficult time uh, for the staff and indeed uh, for their families. Uh, to give her some reassurance, Scottish Enterprise uh, is engaging with the administrator and will provide all possible assistance to help to maintain jobs uh, at the site. In the unfortunate event that any individual should be facing redundancy, the Scottish Government will provide uh, support through PACE, the Partnership Action for Continuing uh, Employment. PACE have, I understand, reached out to the Administrator to offer support uh, to the affected uh, staff. And I can confirm that a local PACE team has provided information on the support available for employees uh, and has requested to meet with the administrator. So hopefully through providing skills, uh, development and employment support, uh, PACE will aim to minimise the time individuals affected uh, by redundancy are out of work. But I will take uh, everything that Claire Baker has said uh, away and see if there's anything further we can do uh, in relation to a very, very difficult situation uh, at Reester Cycling in Glenrothes. Fergus Ewing. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, will the First Minister welcome the announcement this week of a planned investment by Quantum Energy Partners uh, to a value of £300 million in my constituency, uh, an investment which will focus on a site in Ardersir uh, that will develop a, a work in offshore wind and also oil decommissioning, and which will bring massive benefits, possibly for the remainder of the century in terms of uh, employment in the renewable energy field? Does he agree that uh, this development strengthens yet further the case for the duelling of the A96, uh, a case which is supported, uh, presiding officer, by over 90 percent, 90 percent of the readers of the excellent press and journal, the authentic voice of the North, <laughs> and will he, uh, and will he expedite at long last? the delivery of the duelling of the section from Inverness to Aldern, including the Nairn Bypass. First Minister. 
Uh, yes, I, I do welcome uh, that news, of course, of that uh, uh, very important investment. Uh, indeed, decommissioning is integral to the pursuit of an orderly, managed transition uh, to net zero and has the potential to create significant benefits and opportunities for people right across Scotland. Since 2017, uh, through our own decommission, decommissioning challenge fund, the Scottish Government has invested £12 million to support innovation and build capacity in the decommissioning uh, sector. Turning uh, to roads, uh, we remain absolutely committed to improving the A96. And the current plan is, of course, to fully, fully dual uh, the route. But we are currently undertaking a review, as the member knows, of this corridor with the outcomes expected this summer for consultation. In addition, we remain absolutely committed to dualing the Inverness to Nairn uh, section, including the Nairn bypass, and will complete the statutory process for that as soon as possible. And Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, last night, for the second time, the screening of the documentary Adult Human Female at Edinburgh University had to be cancelled as protesters blockaded entrances to the venue. Women were shut out and discussion about women's rights was shut down. Do you agree that freedom of speech should be defended in our academic institutions? And will you join me in urging Edinburgh University to ensure the event can take place. First Minister. Uh, I do agree with uh, Tess White about the importance of freedom uh, of speech and uh, more so in our educational institutions, like our universities. That there should be a, 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 space, uh, that is a safe space for debate, uh, discussion, robust as that uh, may well uh, be. Uh, be. Uh, of course, I haven't seen uh, the film in question, the, the adult uh, human... Uh, female uh, film. I don't know the contents uh, of it. My understanding uh, is that there was a protest uh, against the film taking place and then there was a separate uh, protest which ended up uh, denying uh, those who wanted to see the film uh, access uh, to the screening. Now it is of course a matter for Edinburgh University. I won't uh, look to intervene uh, in that sense but uh, I think I have made it uh, perfectly clear uh, in relation to my stance on freedom of speech particularly within universities. Now I, I see that as no conflict uh, with the other stance that I'm very proud of which is supporting uh, trans uh, rights. That is something I am unequivocal uh, about but we should ensure that our universities uh, are a place, our universities and society more generally are a place where we can have that uh, even robust uh, exchange uh, of ideas. Uh, so I do, uh, I'm sure Edinburgh University have heard what uh, I've had to say and what Tess White uh, has had to say, but it is really important that this is ultimately a decision uh, for uh, Edinburgh University uh, to take. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Ariam Burgess, and there will be a short suspension now to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so before the debate begins.